Welcome to the Activated Storyteller's 72nd Podcast, February 21st, 2008. This week's story is The Castle in the Lake, a story from Tibet. Hi, I'm Dennis. And I'm Kimberly. And I'm Zephyr. And together we are... The Activated Storytellers. We are coming to you from the Everglades at the very southernmost tip of Florida. Wrapping up our Florida tour of schools and libraries, and this week we have seen outhouse races and castles made of coral and alligators. We're going to tell you all about it. We recently performed at James Tillman Elementary School in Palmetto, Florida, and afterward we interviewed a couple of our student volunteers to see what they had to say about the show. And here they are. Yes, my name is Eric Lee Pompey Jr., and I just, I, I just love that show. It, it was so educational and good. What was your favorite thing about it? Uh, uh, um, the tennis racket. The tennis racket part because that really, uh, that's, that really I mean, really takes some skill to do. <laughs> and you are? Tasha Angel. And I, what I liked about the show was when, when, um, when you, when you, uh, when we try to get the water, when we lift up the water and they start swimming in it. Ah, the part where they're swimming with the water. Yes. Okay, what school do you guys go to? James A. Tillman Elementary Magnet School. And what episode are we listening to? Episode, episode 72. 72. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> So we were in Florida for Mardi Gras, which was unusual for us because normally we've done uh, Alabama before, we've done Louisiana before, we've seen all kinds of different Mardi Gras celebrations, but this was the first one we've ever seen in Florida, and uh, they had some rather unusual festivities, including outhouse races, which I believe is the first time I've ever seen that. We were in Homestead, Florida, and we were just about to leave, but we uh, saw signs up saying they were having a Mardi Gras party. And we did go to the Mardi Gras parade, uh, cut some beads as they go down on the floats at Mardi Gras. Uh, an excellent middle school band played there. Uh, the Homestead Middle School Band is w- renowned. They are, have won quite a few awards. We went to a chili cook-off, and, but the real reason we wanted to go was for the outhouse races. Yeah, we did, however, sample some really good vegetarian chili. They actually had some vegetarian chili. It was excellent. Very fruity. Yes, but the outhouse races, that, that was definitely the big draw. How can you pass that up? We had no idea what it was going to be about. In fact, we, we had recorded some audio of um, the outhouse races. Unfortunately, we had technical problems, so we'll just have to recreate that for you as best as we can. Oh, go, go, go. Oh, go, 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 go okay. Go, go, go. Oh, this is unbelievable. And they won. The winning team was absolutely, they were so well coordinated. It was from a realty company called Kais, K-E-Y-E-S, Realty Company. And they they apparently practiced this quite a bit. An outhouse race, what happens is the different um, people who want to put together an outhouse, mostly corporations or little local businesses, put together outhouses and put them on wheels. And then they have two people pushing the outhouse. One person sits inside on a, it's not really a toilet seat, but it looks like one. Um, and they are then... Correction, it's really a toilet seat, but it just hasn't been used. That's true. The person inside has to take rolls of toilet paper and stick them on on a cone as they run this course through a parking lot. That's the challenge. Um, they decorate the houses up. and uh, the, the winning entry had a Valentine's Day motif to it. Or a love motif. It was oh. hug, hug your realtor. Right. Well, it, it reminded me of Valentine's Day, yeah. though. I think that's what they had in mind. And the young lady who was inside the outhouse and, and did the stuffing of the tissue on the poles was really good at her job. The, and the pushers were good. They said they have um, actually won this race three years. We asked them for their inside advice. I think that their uh, aerodynamic design of the outhouse really helped them win. Uh, everybody else was kind of plywood and big and chunky. They had a very streamlined design. That helped. A lot of it, too, is just coordination because it may sound or look very easy, but uh, once once you really look at them getting in there in the race, it's really not as as simple as it looks. So I don't know if there are any other outhouse races around. If there are, um, let us know. We'd like, like to go see another one. This is in Homestead, Florida. And that was, I believe, the 14th year they've had this. Speaking of interesting structures in Homestead, Florida, we took a tour of the Coral Castle. And it, it's hard to get more interesting than this. And you know what? I sat on a coral chair when we were at the Coral Castle, and it was rather comfortable. Yes, amazingly so. You wouldn't think it would be, but it is. And this castle was constructed by one man, an immigrant from Latvia, by the name of Ed, I hope I pronounced his last name correctly, Ed Liedskalnin. 
he constructed it from roughly 1920 to 1940, all by himself, and he stood five feet tall and weighed 100 pounds. Yeah, he was not a very big guy, but... The gates, the, these, some of these stone structures are seven tons. Yes, he used many coral blocks that weighed several tons. Nobody knows exactly how he managed to make this thing because he wouldn't let anyone watch him work. He was very private. He was uh, definitely a very eccentric man uh, from what you can see of him. They have a little audio tour, and uh, there's a lot of sculpture, uh, some gardens, and everything is built out of coral. Another thing that the Coral Castle has in common with the outhouse, besides being a homestead and besides being a structure, is that it was moved. It was constructed originally in Florida City, which is a few miles down the road, and Ed moved this thing to homestead, basically by himself. Right. Um, the backstory, I think, is the most interesting part of Coral Castle. He was inspired to construct the castle because of a young woman that he had been engaged to uh, earlier over in his home country, and she broke off the engagement, and he never quite got over it. Yeah, he always he's called her his Sweet Sixteen, um, and there's all kinds of references to her, of course, in the Coral Castle. And one thing that I think we all noticed was that uh, this man was definitely an engineering genius, and it seems uh, almost, in, in some ways, a little bit of a waste that this was all he ever did because he just sort of lived in seclusion and uh, he was such an eccentric guy that he just shut himself away and worked on this instead of, you know, who knows what else he could have done. And he loved to recycle used uh, materials. like he, he, would, he would salvage old auto parts and make tools and building materials out of them. Quite a resourceful fellow. Um, they have a website. It's coralcastle.com. Okay, and since we uh, visited a castle, let's do a story about a castle. The Castle in the Lake, a story from Tibet. In the land of Tibet, there was a beautiful lake surrounded by hills and mountains. People would say that at times the shadows of the mountain peaks across the water looked just as if there was a magnificent castle in the lake, but that was just a legend, wasn't it? Sometimes it was said that when the moon shone full and the stars gleamed like diamonds on the water, people could be seen rising from the lake. Strange people with eyes of fire and flowing hair hanging like wet leaves around their faces. With that cheery thought, one day a young herdsman was tending his yaks at the edge of the lake. Feeling hot and thirsty, he left his herd of yaks to yak among themselves. So how's the weather? You can't pull the wool over my eyes. We're yaks, not sheep. I'm in the wrong place. Yakety yak, don't talk back. And made his way down to the water's edge. After he had splashed the cooling water onto his face, he began to have his lunch. Oh, let's see what's on the menu today. Oh, don't tell me, don't tell me. Bread with yak butter and yak cheese, just like yesterday and the day before and the day before. That's all I can afford because there's not much market for yaks these days. I just work, 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 and never seem to get ahead. I'm so poor, I can't even afford a journal to write my thoughts in, so I just have to talk to myself. Oh, when will my luck ever change? <laughs> Excuse me, my friend. What? Who are you? And where did you come from? And why are you all soaking wet? And don't you know better than to sneak up on a guy like that? Pardon the intrusion, but unless you have onions on that bread, I'd say you're sad about something. You'd be sad, too, if you made your living tending to animals that look as if they should be extinct already. I never have any money. I never have any good food. I never have any luck. And forget about ever getting a date. Who want to go out with a guy who smells like a ruminant? Why don't you come with me into the lake? I am a servant of the Water King, and he is a very wise man who might be able to help you live a happier life. You mean those stories about the castle down there are true? I thought it was just a rumor started by some realtor. Well, what have I got to lose? And so they jumped in the lake. <laughs> And the herdsman discovered that he could breathe underwater. <laughs> he was mistaken, however, in assuming that this meant he could talk underwater. At last, they arrived at the underwater castle. 
and he was led to the hall where the great king sat on his coral throne. Why have you come here, foolish mortal? Well, I, I was told that you might be able to help me overcome my life of poverty and misfortune. Oh, is that all? Hmm. Very well. Take this dog. But take care that you always feed it before you feed yourself. Got that? For this, I got my socks wet. Just do it, okay? So the herdsman took the dog home, and from that day on, everything he desired appeared before him. He would wake up in the morning and find that barley had been placed in the barley chest, butter in the butter chest, and money. In the money chest, even new clothes appeared in his clothes chest. He had everything but new chests, but he wasn't complaining. One day, he decided to find out just how this dog was hauling in all this stuff. So he hid in the closet in the morning and watched as the dog entered the door, walked over to the hearth, and violently began shaking itself. Suddenly. The dog's skin fell to the ground, revealing a beautiful woman. Hey, she's no dog. The woman went to the barley chest, opened the lid, and placed in it the barley, which appeared from nowhere. Then she did the same thing with the butter chest, the tea chest, the money chest, going all about the house, producing everything that the herdsman wanted. Finally, the herdsman couldn't help himself and rushed out from his hiding place. Aha! I caught you. Oh no! You should not have discovered my secret. Now I fear everything will be ruined. The only thing that will be ruined is that mangy fur coat you've been wearing. I'm going to throw it into the fire right now. Don't you know that fur is cruel? Oh no! You mustn't do that. But he did, and do you know what happened? Absolutely nothing. At least not for a time. They lived happily. For a long time after, and the herdsman continued to grow rich and happy. But then one day he took the woman into town, and the chief's son saw her. Oh, she is very beautiful, and I love the way she carries things in her teeth. I must have her for my wife. And so he seized her. Oh, oh, oh! Let go of me! Oh, 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 oh! And carried her off to his palace. And it was announced that they would be married the following week. The herdsman tried to get the people of the town to help him attack the chief's son and rescue the woman. Come on, everybody! Come on, gather up your swords and slingshots and pitchforks and water balloons and let's bring it on. But nobody dared to attack the son of the chief. Okay.、Uh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. I, I gotta go take my gingers out. Yeah,、uh, but let's do lunch sometime, eh? Feeling very sad, he went down to the shore of the lake, sat down by the large rock, and began to cry. <laughs> Just as before, the king's servant appeared. Why do you weep this time? And the herdsman told him the whole shaggy dog story. I dropped the stallion down the stairs and the fire. The stallion and the chief's son came along and was doing that. Very well. Follow me back to see the king. And so they went back into the lake. And back to the king's palace. This time, the king gave the herdsman a small wooden box. Take this box and go to the top of a high hill and call the chief's son to war. When he has assembled his armies at the base of the hill, open the box and shout, "Fight!" That's it. Does this come with some kind of insurance policy or something? Just do it. Well, the herdsman really had his doubts this time. Nonetheless, he took the box to the top of the hill and called the chief's son to war. You, chiefy boy. Your mom wears garments. Your dad eats comestibles. Your sister is covered with epidermis. All right, wise guy, prepare to die. Charge, men! Oops, the king forgot to mention that part. Let's see. Uh, I fight the box and then open my mouth. No, uh, wait. I I open open the fight. Yeah. Uh, no, so I I open. Ah,、oh, yeah. I open the box and yell, fight. And out of the box sprang hundreds of mighty armed warriors. Wow, that's really thinking out of the box. And after a brief battle, the box warriors defeated the chief's son's army. Hooray! <laughs>
And with that, the herdsman seized the chief's lands and became a powerful and wise ruler of the people. He won back the beautiful young woman to be his wife, and they raised a fine litter, uh, her <laughs> family, and they lived happily ever after and were never dogged by misfortune again. And that's the story of The Castle and the Lake. Wow, we had some references there to outhouses and coral castles, didn't we? Did you catch them? But in this story, the guy gets the girl back. Yay. Yeah, and he doesn't end up building an outhouse out of coral. <laughs> well, I don't know. He might have. Who knows? We also visited the Everglades. We were going to tell you a little bit about that. We saw some alligators, just, you know, a few. How many do you think? In a 15-mile loop, we counted 107 alligators. And these are not like the kind of parks that you go to where you can get close to the alligators behind glass. These are the kinds of parks where there is nothing between you and the alligator, and it is your judgment as to how close you get. At one point, I actually saw a sign along the trail that cautioned about approaching wildlife. Of course, the irony was that this sign was next to a puddle, and in the puddle was an alligator, and in order to read the sign, you had to get close to the alligator. Yes, um, it, we were in their territory. 107 alligators, and they ranged in size from about 6 inches long to about 6 or 7 feet long. Right. There were some big alligators, and if they decided to, they just have your foot for lunch. Yeah, you can't get close. You have to stay 15 feet away. And, and as long as you stay that far away, you should be okay. Because contrary to belief, alligators almost never attack humans. It's very, very rare, and usually when it happens, uh, the human gets too close maybe doesn't know they're there or, or threatens them somehow. They don't attack animals as big as people. No, you can take a tram ride on this um, loop, or you can walk it if you'd like. Or um, we took bikes. Uh, I like doing the bikes. You can even rent bikes there. Yes, and, and the, the alligators would come right up to the edge of the road, too. Yeah, well, they pretty much stayed there. They were, Most of them, you, you would miss them. You would think they were a log. They didn't move. They're always near the water. They didn't really do a lot of moving. Yeah, alligators are very stationary creatures. I chose to walk the loop, actually, because... You did not walk the whole loop. No, I didn't walk the whole loop, but I chose to walk because you can get a lot closer to the alligators that way and a much, much better view than you can on a bicycle. Nuh-uh. You can stop the bicycle and get off. So if you want to see alligators, that's the way to see them. Go to their home. Right. We will be back with you in the next episode, and we are going to talk about our trip swimming with the manatees. Yes, we have a couple of snorkeling trips to talk about next time. We do. We also snorkeled off the Keys, so we've got some adventures, more adventures to share with you next time. And we'll see you then. We'll see you later, alligator. The Activated Storytellers perform at schools and libraries nationwide. On stage, we use American Sign Language, physical comedy, imaginative props, and a giant oversized book to bring the stories to life. For booking information, check our website at www.activated-storytellers.com where you can also find out when the Activated Storytellers will be performing near you. Read a story or order one of our audio CDs. Until next time. <laughs>